Zygmunt Bauman examines how modernity evolves towards a society based on communication, towards a global system characterized by fluidity in social and political relations. Today's society is no less modern than it was at the beginning of the 20th century, says Bauman. Only it is modern in another way. Compared to the first modernity, which was solid, heavy, condensed, today is fluid, light and diffuse. Our present age can be labeled second modernity, late modernity or liquid modernity. The result is an individualized, privatized version of modernity in which we have to make models and in case of failure, the responsibility falls first of all on the shoulders of the individual. We live in days when it doesn't matter where the person who gave the order is. The difference between near and far has been cancelled. It seems that soon the sockets and mobile phones will be out of date. Bauman deals with the human condition in the postmodern era, analyzing the dilemmas of a moral nature, social pressures, emotional conflicts and political pressures that will define us in the future. In his view, violence and moral indifference, globalization, consumerism, politics and individualism are the concepts of the future. The term globalization is generally used to denote hope and trust in the world order. The media has often presented the positive aspects of globalization, ignoring the harmful consequences on the human condition. It thus relies on the mobility of people, capital and information with equal benefits for all. In simpler words, paradoxically, globalization divides more than unites. And even if we expected a hybrid culture, globalization will create a rather homogeneous world. Will the new hierarchy of mobility also take into account the poor of the traditional world or will it manage to impoverish them even more? The new technologies created by man in the utopia of his evolution have as a mass effect a social gap between the categories advantaged by access to technology and those who only pursue from somewhere the latter the rapid advantage of others to an unknown land with a no turning back. At the level of economics and social relations, we are witnessing the end of the era of mutual commitment between supervisors and the supervised, between capital and labor, between leaders and followers. So can the human mind master what the human mind has created? Bowman launches the issue from a pessimistic perspective, but still refuses to accept that the world cannot be changed, marching on the idea that social thinking is a necessity of the human condition. As we spoke about how technology has such an impact on us, and how Bowman takes us into his complex journey of how and why, Sarah Ahmed makes a similar journey in pursuit of happiness, in her well-recognized work feminist killjoys, which was followed by the promise of happiness. In these texts, Ahmed undertakes a robust cultural analysis of the idea of happiness, as it works in Britain today. It is worth noting Ahmed's arguments because it simultaneously captures the individualized nature of happiness that allows us to ignore the situation of others, and the idea that happiness It's something that someone else can give. Happiness, says Ahmed, is what we promise to give to others as an expression of love. We say, I just want you to be happy. As someone who is optimistically optimistic, I think happiness is possible. But rather than an endpoint, it can be found in the passing moments of the day, like watching the sunset, the taste of a fresh tomato, or a meal with friends and family. In these moments, we must appreciate happiness, understand it in the context of an often brutal world, and contextualize it in our own fragility on morality. A friend once posted her own poem on Facebook. After a few days, she cited in disappointment. When we received a like, does it still make sense to write poems? Her experience is common to us all. To a certain extent, 
We each care about what others think about us. The praise increases our self-confidence, and the absence of praise, or criticism, forms a negative self-image. If we give them too much importance, the negative opinions of others can instantly ruin our good mood. Many of our parents and teachers have struggled to make us believe we are a failure. So some of us have become consumed by what others think of us. For example, I was really hurt by his joke about my new hairstyle. My, my accent is terrible. Will he laugh at me? I would say my idea, but I'm afraid of the reactions of the others. When you think all the time about the reactions of those around you, you can no longer be yourself. I don't know who you are, but it happens to me that I choose to do or not to do something depending on the reactions I anticipate in those around me. There were situations where I wanted to make some decisions, but I didn't make them because I was scared too much about what others thought of me. Too much attention paid to how others see you can make your life miserable. You feel hurt by their criticism, you become addicted to them, you have emotional oscillations, you lose confidence in your own abilities and you do not fully develop. People who have a high self-esteem are considered to be rather happy and healthy. Meanwhile, people with low self-esteem appear as being depressed and often socially anxious. If they have a high level of self-esteem, people are able to step up more effective to challenges, but also to negative feedback they might receive from others, seeking to respect at the same time the value of society in which they live. So should we all be some self-confident individuals to change this world into a better place? I think the society needs happy individuals with lots of energy and positivity to run at its finest. And that's why things are going so bad at this point. People forgot about being there for each other and they forgot about the one rule that God really wanted us to follow. Love each other so you can cope with each other. As people often assume they are happy, they can't be fully happy if they have thoughts running up their minds every time they leave their house. Is that because of the government? Because of the society? Well, we don't know. It might be the human concept that was built in that way. We were born with the freedom to choose what's good or bad. We have to choose every little step that we want to make. From who we love to who we hate. Even what's good and bad, we get to choose. If Bauman talks about how we should communicate and understand each other more. Maybe he is right. We should do things together and decide what's good for our nation together. As a society. As a group of people with the same aspirations. But until that we happen. Let's all pretend that we are happy in the world that we live in. <laughs>